Welcome to Cerno News. I'm your host, Andrew Meyer. And today we're going to be talking about the absolutely insane riot that happened last night at Berkeley. Ben Shapiro was there to give a talk. And the alt-left was out in force, actually stabbed a girl in the neck. And uh, the media doesn't seem to want to cover that story. So today with us, we have Massachusetts Senate candidate Dr. Shiva Ayadure. And we have the Gateway Pundit's intrepid White House reporter, Lucian <laughs> Wintrich. So thank you both for coming on today. Now, I have to start with uh, you, Lucian, because I know you're going out to give a talk out at Berkeley. So before you get on over there, I have to ask, well, what are your feelings on all the violence you're seeing in Berkeley? Are you, uh, are you a little bit shy about going out there where they just stabbed a girl in the neck last night? Um, well, luckily, the uh, the university and uh, Milo Incorporated, the company that's putting this on, has guaranteed our safety, which is which is wonderful. We'll see if the mayor uh, asks the police and security to stand down like he did in the past. Um, you know, he has he has a history of doing that. But, you know, for the most part, if conservatives uh, don't actually give these talks um, despite threats of violence, then then the left has truly won. If they're able to shut down, I mean, this is this is uh, it's it's something that goes throughout history, where where one side is so opposed to uh, to ideas that differ from their own that they will threat uh, threaten violence, they'll threaten murder. I mean, we've seen these people on Twitter uh, threatening assassinations. Uh, it is up to us as as conservatives and and uh, outspoken conservatives to go ahead and uh, at least attempt to give <laughs> to give these talks. Yeah, I think it's extremely important that we don't bow down to these people just because they're acting violent. You know, you don't give little kids what they want because they throw a fit. And uh, Shiva, I wanted to ask you because I know that you were out at the Boston Free Speech Rally a few weeks back that a lot of the people in the media tried to say was white supremacist. Uh, meanwhile. You were the keynote speaker, and I have to say, you don't quite fit my picture, <laughs> my mental image of a white supremacist. Yeah, I don't, unfortunately, you know, uh, for them. You know what's interesting with this free speech rally? It was, it was done months before Charlottesville. You know, I agreed to do it, and it was organized by some amazing young high school students and some amazing young college students who really, if you go read their initial paragraph manifesto, was really to expand the spectrum of discussion, which is awesome. And the notion was, you know, of the First Amendment was we all discuss openly. You don't throw acid in people's eyes, etc. So that was their idea. And I agree to do that. After Charlottesville occurred and all of the politicians in Boston, all the ca Senate candidates running, uh, uh, you know, Charlie Baker, the governor, the never Trump or Baker, Mayor Walsh, um, all these guys said, you know, we can't let these Nazis here. We can't let these white supremacists here. They all suddenly got on the bandwagon and they're all self-serving uh, career politicians because they're all coming up for re-election on um, 2018. And as a part of that, you know, they need to get minority votes. Um, Baker, if you know, won barely by 40,000 votes. And he's in, in some ways in a deep situation because he was a never Trumper um, a Republican. And he needs, you know, he's already lost around 200,000 votes. So he's going to move to try to pander to whoever he can. So they call this a white supremacist event. More interestingly was, you know, if you, if you looked at the images of this, there was a, the Parkman bandstand where people like Frederick Douglass, major people given speeches. On the date of the event, they built a 100 square foot fencing around that. And then they had a buffer zone and another 300 radius fence around that. They didn't let any press in. They only let 50 of our people in. We were supposed to be allowed all of our supporters and the press. And basically no one, even the counter protesters, could even hear us. So this was completely violation of the First Amendment, violation of freedom of press. I mean, you go down the list. Um, and, and, and when I, prior to my speaking, there was a sort of a hippie priest who spoke. You know, they, I think they smudged the place with some cannabis. Then I spoke. There was Green Party people people who supported, you know, uh, Sanders. Uh, if you look, there's a panoramic view of people, blacks. There was people of every color in that group, people of every different racial background, every different religious background, every different sexual orientation. Um, you know, Joe Biggs, who they try to say was a white, you know, Joe's married to a Guyanese woman and, you know, big teddy bear. The whole thing was complete nonsense. 
And the politicians risk not only our lives, but also the police lives. They start race wars because it benefits them. They're complete scumbags. Yeah, I saw the coverage of that and all of the... I can't find an eloquent word, but scumbag to, to define these people anymore. They, well, you know. I mean, what they did is rile up a crowd of thousands and thousands of people that went out there in Boston, all of them actually seemingly believing that there was a group of neo-Nazis and white supremacists throwing a rally with no idea that you're the keynote speaker and it has nothing to do whatsoever with what they thought it was. They're just completely brainwashed. And so uh, I get, again, I want to ask Lucian because he's walking into the lion's den. You're going into Berkeley where uh, Lawrence Southern and others have been before and they've seen absolute chaos on the streets. I know Milo said that there's going to be a SEAL security team there, but uh, I want to ask, what are, what are your thoughts on both the what are you expecting? Are you expecting to see the same mob that we've seen in, in Boston? And is it true that uh, you're going to be speaking after Chadwick Moore at the event? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, first of all, I'll just say that the optics uh, created um, at Shiva's last rally, they were some of the funniest I've, I've ever seen in my life, where you have, first of all, an Indian politician or a politician from India who's relatively populist, uh, uh, relatively libertarian, looking out for the actual interests of everyday uh, citizens and everyday Americans standing in this bode uh, bodega with uh, people also from all walks of life, of all different nationalities, and then streets flooded with with just thousands of bi white people, to be honest, they were all white who were protesting um, <laughs> around this little bodega. It was it was uh, just a completely surreal. You couldn't come up with a better parody of how crazy the left was than what we saw that day. So do I do I think that will happen at at Berkeley? Um, no. Well, first of all, I I think that uh, Berkeley Free Speech Week. This is going to be our Burning Man. Um, we have some of the biggest names of the of the conservative movement, all in an incredible lineup. Um, well, in, yeah, the lineup itself is incredible. The scheduling, not great. Uh, I, I had to do some damage control because I guess three people were confused about whether uh, whether they were or were not speaking. So the schedule is um, subject to change, but the main speakers um, are yeah, the main speakers are all all are, are all on board. Ann I'm Coulter, kidding. Steve Bannon, Mike Cernovich, Milo Yiannopoulos, Lucian Wintrich. Who am I forgetting? This is an all-star lineup. This really well, is. Well, you know, what's funny, what's funny there, uh, Alan, is I didn't hear you mention Chadwick Moore, who apparently, according to the schedule, I'm opening for. Now, not to, not to uh, uh, come off like I have too much of an ego, um, but I am right now the, the Washington, D.C. White House correspondent writing for one of the biggest, the third biggest uh, political news website in America. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what we can, how we can fix this, the, uh, the, hey, the, the hookup, scheduling man. oversight. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm still I'm, I'm very excited. I know that a lot of uh, a lot of people are who aren't necessarily speaking are just coming down for this event. It is uh anticipated to be one of the most incredible just lineups um, and groups of conservatives we have here in America. Uh, Lauren Southern will be in attendance, Cassandra, uh, Cassandra Fairbanks, um, uh, Ali, Ak Ali Akbar, who you had on the other day. I know, uh, joking, I know we're joking about it right here, like proper yeah. billing and proper credit, but we have a perfect example. Actually, that stuff kind of matters. We have uh, Shiva Ayadure right here with us, literally the inventor of email sitting with us. Yeah, thanks for email, by the way. I yeah. like email. Uh, the inventor of email, no joke, the inventor of email, and he's running for Senate, and you would think this would be kind of a big deal. Like, wait a minute, the inventor of email must be uh, kind of a genius. He's running for Senate. Maybe uh, I should listen to what he has to say. Uh, meanwhile, all I've heard out of the media is that uh, you're leading a, a white supremacist rally. That's this seems to be something a little bit off there in the coverage of your your candidacy, Dr. Shiva. Yeah. By the way, I should come out to Berkeley. I'd love to come out there. But let, you, let me, you need to. You yeah. absolutely need to. Tell, tell me when it is because because people should hear the talk I actually gave Lucian and Andrew. Because if people hear that talk, it'll snuff out and expose the liberalism nonsense that's taking place. Remember. Lucian, when I was finishing up that rally, by the way, I was coming out, I was attacked by a mob of people who started coming. And I actually quieted them down. 
there was a black guy telling me, let him speak. And a white guy's calling me a, a, a white supremacist. <laughs> it was surreal, the whole thing. But, you know, when we talk about the invention of email and this whole notion of uh, who's creating these narratives, they're very closely linked. Let me explain what I mean by that. You know, I came from a low caste, untouchable uh, group in India. Deplorables. The fact that my parents even made it here is unique. You know, I went through the public school systems in New Jersey. And as a 14 year old kid, you know, I was obviously very motivated. We were newer, primarily, mainly African Americans in a small medical college. Whereas a 14 year old kid, I was given the challenge to convert the entire inner office mail system, what they used to call the inbox, outbox, folders, this whole system. We're not talking about simple text messaging. We're talking about the entire system of office communications, 40,000, 50,000 lines of code, called it email, a term never used before in the English language, and then got the first US copyright when. In 1980s, that was the only way to protect software inventions. It was only 1994 that the stupid policymakers in Washington realized software was a digital machine. So by, you know, by the letter of the law, by what I did, I invented email. In fast forward 2011, I never made a penny off that made money many other ways. When it went into the Smithsonian, Andrew, that's when the liberal media and the liberal elites who I was part of MIT, where I've been on the front page of MIT many other times for inventing many other uh, inventions. But when it went into the Smithsonian, it was like a new skull was found in Africa, and it reset the narrative of where innovation comes from. You know, the fact is, not, you don't have to go to MIT, you don't have to be a dropout out of Harvard to innovate any of these things. There's a lot of smart people, and what's ironic is the Washington Post did a major miscorrection, and Gawker Media, who claims they love black people and minorities and gays started calling me all sorts of awful names because the notion of a Indian guy, Indian immigrant teenager, American teenager in Newark inventing email blows the socks off people, the same people who claim they want to help people of minorities and help us get there. And when they do get there, it's hard for them to accept it. That's what the contradiction is. When the fact is that innovation can occur anywhere and the real issue behind the invention of email where it links to this is you have a set of anointed ones, the priesthood, what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex, a deep state, they wanna anoint who's an inventor, who isn't. And this is no different than a neo-caste system, right? In the, in the Indian system, you have the Brahmins, the priests, they're the ones who decided what narratives ever were. The invention of email, what's fascinating about it is the facts are so obvious who invented email. And the reaction, the vitriol, and the bullshit I've had to go through to just lay out the facts, that's what the real nonsense is. And this is being driven by so-called liberals. And that's what's fascinating about this. So for me, you know, if anyone heard the, the, what the talk I actually gave at that free speech rally, which was really questioning why the hell did anyone ask me, people are asking me why I'm gonna get on the stage with white supremacists. And my question was, does anyone ever ask why people get on the stage with Hillary Clinton? I'm telling you, she's a white supremacist, deep and deep and deep, because she's the one who called black children super predators. No one ever asked why people get on the stage with, you know, Jimmy Carter. He said we need ethnically pure neighborhoods. No one ever asked why they get on the stage with Joe Biden. He said the only reason he was going to vote for Obama was he was the first per, uh, black person, you know, who was clean and articulate. These guys are the racists, but they do better PR. Yeah. And that's so disgusting. It's 100% true. That's why we need people getting out there, even into the, the mall of the masses that hate us out in Berkeley, for example. And I'm curious, Lucien, Lucien you're listening to all of this. Uh, if we could get a sneak preview, what is it you're thinking of talking about at this rally? Because there's a lot of people there that, that probably hate each might have a chance to actually hear you by accident. And there's a lot of people come to support you I'm sh as well, I'm sure. But uh, what are you thinking of speaking about out of this historic rally? Well, you know, the mere fact that these groups uh, like Antifa and these uh, the far left mentality in general has created a culture where they can uh, um, point to somebody and say, okay, well, well, you are a, uh, Shiva's a minority, but you're the wrong type of a more, uh, minority, therefore you're a white supremacist. Or me, I'm the wrong type of gay, so therefore I'm, I'm a, uh, what is it, uh, alt-light, the label that, <laughs> that now we have, uh, uh, bigot and, and self-loathing uh, person. Um, 
I I'm going to be tackling that. I'm going to be tackling the the inconsistencies in in the leftist narrative and how it is setting this country back. I my sort of background before uh, my current reporter gig was in the arts and in culture. I was my mother was a painter growing up. My father ran a uh, a design firm, and I, I grew up going to galleries and and seeing uh, art galleries and, and museums and seeing how. This uh, the left has permeated culture itself in such an awful way that we're losing we're losing touch with what actually the innovation and the open mindedness that made us one of the uh, the most incredible countries on earth. Yeah, and I think what people don't understand is uh, the whole mentality of the left right now. This this thing that stifles innovation doesn't want to give credit to people like Dr. Shiva. That doesn't want to actually have an open dialogue. I think people don't understand the environment that's being created is literally a cult-like mentality. These people are literally living in a cult-like atmosphere. And I wanted to raise a subject that also has been getting little attention, like the woman that was stabbed in the neck last night at Berkeley. The media doesn't want to talk about that. You know, a lot of the people in the media, like Chris Cuomo on CNN, uh, Chris Cuomo in a tweet compared Antifa, the alt-left domestic terrorist organization that dresses in all black, uh, wearing face masks like a like a modern version of the KKK, wearing the opposite color but doing the same exact thing. Uh, Chris Cuomo compared the alt left domestic terrorists, Antifa. He compared them to World War II veterans. So that insane comparison is out there. Meanwhile, they're stabbing a girl in the neck in Berkeley, and a, a young man named Nathan. He went to the inauguration of President Trump. There is an alt-left group called the J-20. They're going to disrupt. They're going to protest. Uh, they encourage this man to commit crimes. Uh, he got busted. And before, you know, he had to pay the penalty, he committed suicide. You know, the alt-left cult is driving people to commit crimes, to be violent. And ultimately now they're, they've driven a young man to suicide. So for the people watching this that don't understand why the free speech rally out in Berkeley is so important, you know, the, the alt left is, is hurting people, stabbing people in the neck, driving people to suicide. Please go on Twitter. Ask Chris Cuomo. Ask Chris Cuomo on Twitter uh, if he disavows alt left Antifa violence after he called them uh, similar to World War II veterans. And Dr. Shiva, you've been dealing with this stuff out in Massachusetts. They're trying to conflate you as a white supremacist. Uh, I know there's a campaign running against you that I've had personal experience, a personal run in with one of the supporters. A uh, Jeff Deal, a Jeff Deal supporter, and he was a real uh, interesting character, real divorced from reality. And I wanted you to give some of your perspective on Jeff Deal and the campaign he's running against you. Yeah. So what you have to understand is, you know, there's always been three dynamics in political history. There's the establishment, then there's change agents like ourselves, and then there's what we call the not so obvious establishment in either side, left or right. And Deal represents a not so obvious establishment. Here's a guy who was a failed sign salesman, uh, gets uh, into a Senate, uh, gets into a House of Rep seat, cannot even win a Senate seat, a state Senate seat. And uh, when the Trump uh, election occurs, this is even more fascinating. Donald Trump had assigned a guy called Vincent DeVito to be the chairman of the Trump campaign in Massachusetts. Uh, they brought in a, a a group, Dean Cavaretta, who brought in a woman called Bonnie Johnson, who then brought in Jeff Deal. Well, those people, that office in Littleton, Massachusetts, shortly after it was started, was shut down because they stole the Trump data. OK, fired. <laughs> Thereafter, Vincent DeVito, who's, by the way, a senior position in the minister, the interior ministry, uh, um, started in Hudson, Mass., well, the deal guys then used that small event, by the way, which they were thrown out, to say that he was a uh, Massachusetts co-chair. OK, absolute lie. There was only one chairperson that was Vincent DeVito. So when we found out about this, we also learned that what deal did, it started doing a backroom deal with Charlie Baker, who's a never Trump or Republican governor, to tell him, hey, um, I'm going to run against you for governor. Baker didn't want a contested convention. So what he did was tell Deal, I'll support you in the background to be the Senate candidate. OK, and I know this because I've seen them played out at an event where I showed up, Deal showed up and Baker introduces Deal and doesn't even, and completely ignores me when I'm out in the press was the first one to announce, et cetera. 
So, so we found pictures where Trump backstage is pointing a deal pissed off with him because he knows he's a traitor. So what deal does is he photoshops a picture of him shaking hands with Trump. Why do we know it's Photoshop? There's three hands. It's called the three handed deal. Three hands of Trump. We had one of the best forensics expert uh, uh, tech fusion do this. So we put put this out there as a result of that. Another local scumbag, you know, best way, Howie Carr, Jeff Kooner, who run a local radio station hosting a show. Never have they allowed me to even come on the show. Well, in an open meeting, we expose Howie Carr. And what Carr does in response is finds an old arrest mugshot of me, which the case is completely dismissed, completely fake news. And while he's showing the mugshot, is running deal ads. Yeah, I <laughs> Amazing. saw Amazing. I saw right. some of this so, stuff from how he uh, – myself with very few connections to Boston, I and, even saw people posting on social media of this stuff Howie Carr was putting out there. I never even heard of Howie Carr. First time I heard of him is because he's slandering you and defaming you, and I thought it was absolutely disgusting. Well, well, and, uh, and what's even more interesting is after we expose Howie Carr as a fake Trumper, he's paid to play. Yeah. Openly he said, oh, I'm not going to have Shiva on because he hasn't paid me. Um, he that <laughs> runs to Trump. He runs to D.C. the next day to him and his wife to take a picture of Trump. You see, so the so in Massachusetts, you have the fake Trumpers like Deal and you have the never Trumpers and you have the real loyalists or the agents of change like myself. What's even more interesting is the news just came out two days ago that Dirty Deal and his cohorts, his uh, right hand or his uh, just the, the other side of his head, uh, Holly Robichaud, was a lobbyist for the Saudi Arabian government. A lobbyist who was who had then enlisted veterans to lobby against a bill which would have allowed victims of 9-11 to go sue governments like Saudi Arabia. I so have to ask you, uh, I have to ask you, I'm very curious because all this stuff that you're bringing up is just so outrageous and inflammatory. What do you think the electorate out in Massachusetts is like right now? Because obviously they have Elizabeth Warren, one of the most... You know, I don't want to say liberal. I'm just going to say leftist. One of the most far left senators out there. Uh, you know, Massachusetts elected her, but Massachusetts has previously elected a few Republicans. Do you think that the electorate out there, one, can see through the politics of a guy like Jeff Deal, who sounds like to me like a fake Republican, like Paul Ryan, a rhino type? And, and are they going to abandon the, the liberal Elizabeth Warren? So here's the dynamics. I, I think Massachusetts is an opportunity to really strike the second revolution. And let me explain what I mean by that. Look, the founders of this country were, as I've said, you know, they were surveyors, architects, blacksmiths, artists, et cetera. And the vision was that you would participate, in, in, participating in governance was an honor, and then you would go back to work. And my election here, you know, guys, an inventor, scientist, entrepreneur, immigrant, in many ways, the epitome of the American dream. Um, winning will not only send shockwaves here, but it'll be, I think it'll be an inspiring testament to what can happen when everyday people actually run. That's what this is about. Deal, you know, no skills. I mean, none of these guys know the difference between a, an inline six or a V8 and differential equation chemistry. You're talking about complete morons. These people have no skills, and yet they think that they can support Massachusetts, which is supposedly the center of education, medicine, biology, AI, technology, et cetera. And what we really see happening in Massachusetts is that when I get in front, Andrew and Lucian, it's like either a standing ovation or I win. So these guys are purposely making sure I don't get out. So we've had to do very interesting things like send Elizabeth Warren a DNA test kit. She returns it. We tweet it out. It goes viral. Then we get on Fox News. You see what I'm saying? So we've been able to do this in very, very different ways. But I can tell you on the ground, the average uh, electorate in Massachusetts is an independent, 2.3 million independents, only a half a million so-called Republicans and 1.5 million so-called Democrats. 40 percent of the Democrats hate Warren. The average independent hates Warren, hates Republicans. Well, in comes Shiva Ayadure, right? I can on one hand eviscerate Monsanto and expose their fake science, which will bring me a lot of people from Western Mass. I can talk about the importance of the Second Amendment. At the same time, I can talk about the importance of online education, high-tech, vote-tech education for the middle part of the state, which went Trump. And I can also talk about innovation. 
So these guys are cannot compete with me. So their only way to stop me is to make sure I don't get any press. Well, I totally understand the to the blackout on real independence that the mainstream media has had for a long time. That's why outlets like Cerno News, like the Gateway Pundit, are so very, very important. And I appreciate that you have nuanced thoughts on so many, a variety of issues that really, really matter. But in this upcoming election, it does seem like one of the prevailing issues is going to be DACA. And I, I want to get your opinion on that in just a moment. But before we get there, I want to ask Lucian Wintrich because he put out a fantastic article uh, just the other day citing Ann Coulter, citing Roger Stone, and explaining what the consequences of DACA are and what the likelihood of President Trump actually supporting a DACA deal without even getting a wall are. So, Lucian Wintridge, please explain for the people, tee it up, what is DACA as far as the importance, the future of America? So, okay, DACA is essentially an unconstitutional order that was passed by Obama um, during his second term. It's, it's allowing for these two-year continuances with uh, people who came to this country illegally. They can, according to the, the order, they can keep applying for these continuances, I believe, up until 35. Um, so Trump, Trump initially said, OK, well, we'll just we'll extend this for six months, which means you can still you can still uh, apply to be part of this program, get another two year continuance in the next six months. So that'll go all the way up till uh, what, 17, 18, 19, uh, 2019. The the issue is, aside from the, the order itself being unconstitutional, is uh you know, there, there are mixed opinions. Uh, a, a lot of people are saying this is not a path to citizenship. You do have to reapply for it every two years, which is true. But we're kidding ourselves to say that it won't be the longer you're in this country, then that's a case that is the path to citizenship. I mean, that's that's more or less what we uh, what we look at, how long these, these children, these people, because it goes up to the age of 35. They're not really children um, <laughs> uh, when we're actually reviewing citizenship. Now... Why, my problems my problems with DACA aside, what we really need to be looking at is, okay, so Obama screwed us over on many of these fronts. Um, it would be fine. Immigration is still uh, rapidly going down, as we all know, right? Illegal immigration, border crossing, that's all going down. And with, uh, with that going down, crime rates are going down. Uh, drug prices are going up, which is a good thing, right? Free market, less of it in this country. Um, so obviously less addicts. I mean, it's having what what Trump has uh, constituted so far. Good policy. What we want, though, is we want something to uh, secure our borders from this presidency for the future. We want we want a long term solution. We don't just need another uh, hopefully another uh, 40 years of Trump where he keeps uh, tough on immigration vocally. We, we need actual physical solutions such as a border wall. And what you're seeing right now more and more is that his base, uh, the base that, that were uh, waiting for a, uh, a wall for half their lives and being promised a wall, they're becoming disillusioned. Because Trump now, at first, oh, I'm negotiating, uh, maybe we'll keep DACA, but we'll give you a wall. And then all of a sudden, oh, no, no, uh, it's it's no part of the wall negotiation. Then what's he getting? What are, what are What's his base getting? What are we getting? Um, and it seems like absolutely nothing. Uh, Roger Stone and Coulter, they, they all... Uh, they're growing disillusioned with uh, with the Trump presidency unless we're uh, unless we start to see more action. Um, but I had, a, I had a, uh, a woman call up my show last night and she said, listen, I'm a uh, I'm a baby boomer and uh, it, it is up to your generation to push on these issues to make sure that we do secure our borders. Um, because all she said during my entire life, politicians will say we will secure the borders and it doesn't happen. Um, and you, I, on the uh, not not to get on a uh, off on a um, down, Dennis Miller rant here, but uh, if if it's it's frustrating that article that I wrote that was largely critical of uh, President Trump's foreign policy as it currently stands, um, was met with a lot of pushback. They said, "Oh, you're no better than CNN. You're no better than than MSNBC." 
if we don't if we don't uh, talk to the base, talk to the actual base, right? Um, talk to if this is a populist movement, talk to the people, see what they're thinking, report on what they're thinking. Then um, I mean, th then it's nothing. And, and Trump, you know, he is reading. He's watching. He's watching Cerno TV. He's, he's watching Infowars. He's reading Breitbart. Um, he is in tune with what we're saying. And if we don't say it, he won't know. And, he, you know, McMaster is never going to take any of this to him. Yeah. Uh, what I saw yesterday was the whole new media, the independent media, the alternative media, whatever you want to call us, uh, Cerno News, Infowars, Breitbart, just completely hammer, knock it out of the park, yeah. the idea that Trump would do DACA without getting in return yeah. at least the wall and E-Verify in the Rays Act. So it was very heartening to see that the new media really has an effect because this morning Trump completely turned his language around. He, I think he got the message a little bit. And I think a large part of that was due to Breitbart with their headline Amnesty Don said absolutely calling out uh, Donald Trump. And I know Ann Coulter was livid and both Ann Coulter and Steve Bannon, who probably wrote that headline for Breitbart, are going to be speaking out in Berkeley with you. So that's just going to be such a wild event. Like you said, the burning man of the right, most likely. That's just going to be an absolutely yeah. fantastic and phenomenal historical event. And uh, Dr. Shiva Ayadure, I wanted to ask you, because I know you're a big fan of Steve Bannon, um, I asked you before, what are your thoughts on DACA? It's going to be such a controversial issue in this upcoming election. There's, there's going to be no way to avoid it, really. And I know you're a big fan of Steve Bannon. I think he was one of the, the champions yesterday letting Trump know that he can't do any kind of deal without securing America's future and preventing future waves of millions of immigrants that would need another DACA 10 years from now. Was that to me, Andrew? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so look, uh, I, you know, this is very personal to me. You're looking at someone who came here as a seven year old immigrant. My father came here first. Um, and remember, when my parents came, they had to it was all based on merit based immigration. My, my dad had to send in his grade reports. Um, you know, he was like the best of the best engineers in India. My mom uh, to this day, when she graduated with her master's in statistics, still yet to this day, no woman has graduated from that school. I mean, these people were even you can even I don't want to bring the genetics in. these people are quite anomalous people who are allowed into America and they had to submit all sorts of verification of their grades, reference letters, et cetera. My dad came first and then we came about a year later. It was a privilege to come here. You can't go to India without a visa. You can't go to China without a visa. So for me, this entire thing is basically about uh, people being able to bring in illegal immigrants being able to get votes. Uh, it's all about voting. And that's what it's about. And and we allow illegal immigration. And then we further allow the fact that you don't even need a voter ID to go vote. The whole thing is a complete scam. And anyone who's an immigrant, who's a legitimate immigrant, looks at this and they wonder, do we have a nation or we don't? And it, we still live in the era of nation states. So that's one piece. The other piece is Civics 101. When Trump came out and he said that he was going to enforce it, that's what the executive branch does. The judicial branch, you know, basically interprets a law and Congress is supposed to put this together. But I can assure you that it, the notion of having a strong border, which is, by the way, every human cell has a border. Uh, we have an atmosphere which has a border. Nature has designed everything with borders around it. It lets in certain things, doesn't let in other things. Or otherwise, in the human cell example, you get viruses and you die. So the notion of a border is essential to any type of structure that exists. It's a biomimesis of this thing. So um, this entire aspect of fighting this, and, and I think if Trump succumbs on this, I think he's going to have a major problem. Because, and, and by the way, to Lucian's, I think your point, the reality is, let's put almost Trump over here. In my opinion, Trump's winning was get, was was a huge victory for people. Mm. Every day he stays in office is a victory. But but I think we shouldn't focus on Trump alone. The issue is what occurs now. Version 2.0, 3.0 of the operating system here is how do we get others? You know, the, it's really a movement. What changes the world is not politicians; it's movements. And what Trump did was he basically threw a huge battering ram at all of these complete swamp creatures. And they're flailing and, and he's trying to do 3D chess there with them. So whatever's going on there, we're not going to be able to figure it out. But it's really up to us and what we do. 
you know, how we advance this, how we hit hard on it, how we push the envelope on it to really get rationality winning, not left or right, not quote unquote liberal or conservative, but rational behavior. And that's what needs to win. I mean, I can be against Monsanto, but I'm also against the Paris Accords. So the liberals don't know what to do with me. Wow, he's against Monsanto, believes in organic food, but I can also eviscerate the Paris Accords because it has nothing to do with pollution. It's basically making Al Gore gets rich, right? The Bushes get rich and we all get carbon taxed. So we need to have people, rational people in this process. And I think that's what the fight is here. The establishment versus the elites, truth versus lies. Well, I can see why they don't want to put you on TV. Uh, they might have some problems winning an election if they if people actually heard your message. I don't think they want to run candidates against someone that could speak like you. In our comments, people are saying stuff like, wow, I like this guy. Bless him. That Those are the comments that you're getting right now for, for what you're saying. So uh, I understand why they don't want to put you on TV. But as you said, it's not about Trump at this point. Uh, Mike Cernovich... The esteemed political reporter is always talking about Revolution 18, taking back Congress. Yes, we won the White House. We got Trump in there. But now we got to kick out the rhinos. We got to kick out the left. We got to put people in the Congress, in the Senate, in the House of Representatives that actually stand for the agenda we all voted for in 2016. So awesome stuff that you brought to the table there. And I wanted to ask Lucian. Uh, because I know you had a chance to interview uh, Dr. Sebastian Gorka recently, mm. another brain right. alum, and I was wondering if he, if you had a chance to pick his brain on DACA, if he, if he had any thoughts that he imparted to you on DACA, and if not, what did you take away just from from interviewing Dr. Sebastian Gorka, someone that was actually working inside the White House? I mean, for he is he is easily one of the, I I think one of the most brilliant people to to even talk to. He's an incredible, incredible uh, intellectual, beyond well read. Uh, it was a a very enlightening experience for me, and uh, we actually DACA really just blew up um, pretty recently. So I think that interview might have been too. Two weeks ago, so really, right before this, this was at the forefront of the uh, the discussion. But when when we're just uh, when we're just looking at that order, when we're just looking at DACA, um, I think the the easiest maybe metaphor, uh, if you will, for for that for that ridiculous unconstitutional order is okay. So Shiva again, he came here legally. He he, his family went through the process. Now imagine um, seeing another family who. Who uh, robs a bank, or even Bernie Madoff's family, or even easier, a family that robs a bank, right? Their parents rob a bank. Uh, they have a couple million now in their account uh, under the mattress, and they're caught, right? They're caught by immigration. <laughs> immigration. They're caught by the uh, the police, and um, all of a sudden, the the left liberals say, would the liberals say, "Oh no, no, it's not the kid's fault." that the parents committed this crime, let him keep the money, let them keep the money. It's fine. He's used to it. He's used to spending it. I mean, that's, that's what we're going on. Uh, I mean, that's the equivalent of, of some of this asinine immigration policy. I have to, I have to cut in right here. What you're saying is absolutely on point, but then what they bring it back to is, Oh, well, yeah, maybe they, they, how can you say they have stolen goods? They crossed the border. They own this land. Uh, they were the they were the they were here first. They were the the natives. To which I say, you know, uh, you're going back a long, long time to say <laughs> someone whose grand grandparents grandparents, you know, did don't have a claim to the land at that point. But I mean, we uh, you know we could play that 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 stupid game that liberals play. Oh well, it was the Indian land, uh, li- Indians land, or this one tribe's land. Uh, before yours, but okay. Before that tribe, there was another tribe that wore them right. that land, and be, uh, and so on and so forth. And they that, that is the entire the, they geopolitical. Pretend only climate. the white people are the ones that have ever done conquest. Only white people yeah. have done conquest. Everybody else is virtuous, especially the Indians, like Elizabeth Warren, a super vir- <laughs> virtuous Indian, uh, well, right? Right, Doctor. Uh, you know, she, she's at a, if you go to Harvard Law School, you know, there's a picture of her. With all the, you know, it's like a monument that they have all the professors. Well, if we want to start taking down stuff, we should take down her picture. Does she have a headdress on? Does she have a feather headdress yeah, on in the picture? She doesn't have that on. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm sponsoring a real Indian dinner at my house. Real Indian curry, real Indian corn. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, 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 the other part of this is, you know, about two weeks ago, we got a, you know, I spoke at the elite Cape Cod Republican Club. Right. These are probably the wealthiest Republicans in Cape Cod. 
Uh, if you go look about four months ago, I spoke, you know, great standing ovation. Everyone liked the journey, the talk, uh, this great immigrant guy, the American dream. Loved it, right? I'm sort of their darling. Well, two weeks ago, my comp communications director gets a little text message saying, oh, we can't have Dr. Shiva coming, essentially because he was in that free speech rally. We're afraid Antifa will show up. Now, this is fascinating, right? Um, these are people who have sent poor white kids, poor black kids, poor people to fight their wars. And then when we go to fight their wars, be it in Iraq, Vietnam, Afghanistan, they're the ones who pull out God bless America, the American flag, and get everyone revved up on American jingoism, right? To say we're going to fight for American values over there. But none of their kids have to go fight, by the way. Now, here in their own neighborhoods, when a guy who's of American, of, of Indian American origin, the American dream in many ways, comes there, stood in front of 40,000 people defended their values and wants to come in to speak, they won't do that. And they run essentially as cowards. So, so we got to, these are people part of the deep state. They don't care about Nazis and communism, all of this. So this is all manipulation. And we need to start understanding this. They are imperialists. They're the globalists. And, and, and the depths of them is quite insidious. So they don't want to stand up in their own neighborhoods to fight for the First Amendment. And yet they will send, you know, under the aegis of we got to go go after this country, that country. And I think this contradiction is we need to start pulling out in this next wave of this movement here, that who is a real enemy here? You know, Bannon brought it up beautifully in that 60 Minutes interview. It's a working people of this country actually produce value are the patriots. And anyone beyond that, we got to start questioning the political class. I'm totally I'm totally there. I think everyone listening in the comments gets exactly what you're saying. And if you have questions for Dr. Shiva Ayaduri or for Lucian Wintrich, throw them up there right now. I'm going to be checking out for some for some questions for these these guys, these amazing, insightful guys. Um, uh, Dr. Jane Ruby says hi to you, Dr. Shiva. Uh, I could tell I said hello. She doesn't say hi to me, though. That's no, she did not say hi to Lucian. Well, you know, Jane, uh, next time I see you at the MAGA meetup, I'm not saying hi to you either. <laughs> oh! <laughs> That's great. But, but I uh, think oh, a huge opportunity in this country, what Trump did was he dropped a huge, like, cluster bomb on the establishment, you know, which was necessary. What, what path he pursues, I think he's already done a service to this country, in my opinion. So let's not, fo the focus is not their focus, as we talked about, is what is it we're going to do to extend this movement? Yeah, I'm totally with you. Someone in the comments says, you're much better than Jeff Deal. I wanted to ask you about that. You call them a uh, dirty deal and backroom deal. <laughs> are, are these uh, linguistic kill shots in the vein of Scott Adams that you designed? I, I you just sent you a little that? meme that we got. I don't know if you saw it. I sent it to your cell phone. Look, okay. he, he is, you know, he is a dirty deal. You know, he's, you know, when I first got involved over the last 120 days, we figured out the swamp in Massachusetts. By the way, Washington is a swamp. Massachusetts is a sewage that feeds that swamp. It's all the academic elites. But if you think about a guy like Dirty Deal, you know, he comes across as a nice guy, says he's the Eagle Scout. But if you remove the face and their guy's a complete scumbag, you know, he basically has a woman called Holly Robichaud. He cuts backroom deals. He just relies on the gas tax, knows he has no chance of winning. He's got two PACs who are supporting him. Right now, the PACs are, it's like a shark frenzy. Anyone who says any, you, you guys can start a PAC tomorrow and probably make a couple of million. All you need to do is say negative stuff against Warren, you'll get money. So these people are no different than those uh, evangelists, televangelists who are getting money from poor people. So people should be very mindful of these PACs because they don't really care to defeat Warren. They care to line their pockets. Most of these guys that we're talking about, guys like Jeff Deal, have never probably made more than a couple hundred K in their lives. You know, So this is payday for them. They don't care to defeat Warren. All they care about is one thing, lining their pockets, getting brand equity, and continuing their political nonsense. And it's time we get rid of all of them. Dirty deal needs to be exposed. The fact that, you know, he, and when I mean he, him and his goons, his, his main goon, Holly Robichaud, collaborated with the Saudi government against 9-11 victims sort of says it all. And faking a Photoshop handshake, you know, the guy's unskilled, should probably learn how to get, use Photoshop, first of all. So we're talking about people 
who don't deserve to represent any of us. And it's really time that we all got rid of them. They're not Americans. They're leeches on the entire system. As Bannon said, they're a political class uh, who serve nobody but themselves. And yeah. we should really start wondering why we're even supporting any of these parties. Yeah, I told uh, potential Congressman Paul Nealon, who's running against uh, Paul Ryan, I told him that most Republicans and Democrats shouldn't have an R or a D. They should have a B for banker owned or P for pirate. Because exactly. they don't stand... They don't stand for conservative principles or liberal principles. Most of these people are just puppets of the banker class, the donor class. Uh, thank you guys both for coming on so much today. I wanted to get some questions for you, but all anybody has to say is uh, we love you. We love uh, we love Shiva. We love Lucian Wintrich. So uh, it's, it's all love for you guys. No, no questions today. See, it's a movement okay. of love. It's a love movement. It is. <laughs> If Amen. This is, somebody this is says. Nazism and white supremacy. Let's bring it on. <laughs> well, if you guys uh, would like to throw out any final comments um, and where they can find you each on social media, and definitely we're wishing, uh, or I'm not going to say we're wishing you luck, but we're following your campaign very closely, uh, Dr. Shiva Ayadure, your your campaign for Senate. We're watching you, and uh, Lucian Wintrich, we're we're wishing you safety, safe travels out in Berkeley, and an amazing speech. Uh, and from each of you, uh, I want to know your final thoughts and where people can find you on social media. Uh, Dr. Shiva Ayaduri. Yes, yeah, so people can find us at shiva.com. Chief for Senate, um, give us lots of money, whatever money you can give. We're going to use every dollar you spend. We're going to make it stretch it. I'm an entrepreneur. We don't have political consultants working for us. I'm funding a lot of this campaign with my own resources. And furthermore, it's really brains that we need not really money. So whatever you give is, you know, is going to st stretch a long way. Thank you. But it's Shiva for Senate.com. Shiva for Senate.com and Lucian Wintrich, where can people find you? What do you want to leave them with? Well, um, yeah, if you're in the area, vote for Shiva. He's incredible. Uh, and then, yeah, with me, I tell you what, uh, Twitter is Lucian Wintrich, read the gateway pundit. We are, Right now, yeah, the third largest uh, political American news site. Very fun site. I recommend it. Uh, keep tuning in to Cernovich TV. <laughs> I love you all. <laughs> I, have a, I have one question for you. Someone said everyone come out to the Moore Rally in D.C. tomorrow. Uh, can you tell people real quick, what's the Moore Rally? Is there any chance you're going to be there? So, there, yeah, there is a rally in D.C. tomorrow. I think it's... Um, what what are the it's an acronym what what, what are the letters eh, you got oh, me more yeah mother of all rallies that's it that's so it. um to be honest uh, i looked i looked at the lineup i two of the people there are, are promising uh, uh a bunch of the other people are a waste of time i'm not going to uh, point out names i don't know i think it'll be interesting i'm going to show up um if you're in the dc area i uh dc is a very b boring city so um yeah, I mean, uh, grab your grab your mom, grab your wife, uh, grab a picnic basket, and head to the uh, mother of all rallies this this Saturday. Uh, selfies with Lucy and Wintrich. I will soon. say I'll be taking selfies, uh, five bucks a piece. Hey, Lucy, you... when does that rally start in Berkeley? Um, so Berkeley starts uh, on Sunday next uh, next Sunday. It is the twenty fourth. To uh to Wednesday, so and all throughout this time, uh, the twenty fourth is really the kickoff date. I will be speaking uh, so far on the twenty fourth. <clears throat> By Wednesday, we have Bannon, we have uh, Milo, we have Ann Coulter, Mike Cernovich, um, and then Tuesday we have uh, some other very uh, impressive people whose names are eluding me. And uh, yeah, so you know, I mean, it's we have so many events just coming up in the next couple weeks. It's kind of. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, we. I think the the right has finally uh, s took our claim of the narrative, and people are paying attention, and they're realizing that what we're reporting on what we're doing is is not part of this uh, uh, disgusting progressive propaganda machine that has been controlling the American conversation for far too long. Yeah. Uh, before I ask P uh, you where people can get a selfie with you, Shiva. Uh, because we, we know now where they can go get a selfie with Lucian coming soon. Uh, I want to I want to reiterate to Lucian's point about how the media is definitely stirring up all kinds of terrible things in American society. Uh, please go on Twitter, ask Chris Cuomo, Chris Cuomo, the CNN 
anchor and host. Ask him if he supports Antifa still. If he still supports Antifa after a girl got stabbed in the neck at Berkeley, after uh, there was an Antifa suicide, basically, and you can use that hashtag Antifa suicide, hashtag Antifa stabbing. So go ahead and ask uh, Chris Cuomo on CNN, uh, do you still support Antifa, hashtag Antifa stabbing, hashtag Antifa suicide? Go ahead and ask uh, Chris Cuomo that on Twitter, everybody. We'll, ha we'll have some fun with that. And uh, Shiva Ayadure, Dr. Shiva Ayadure, where can people get a selfie with you coming soon? Well, uh, keep an eye out for September 22nd. And we're going to be announcing something very soon on Monday, something very, very big that we're going to do on September 22nd. And uh, I, I don't want to reveal it now, but keep an eye out on Twitter on uh, Monday or Tuesday, and we'll let you know where you can get a selfie with me. All right. Hey, Stay hey. tuned to ShivaForSenate.com, to TheGatewayPundit.com, and, of course, right here to Cerno News, Mike Cernovich's Facebook right here, Facebook.com slash Mike Cernovich. Thank you both so much for joining us. To everybody out there, have a great day. Great. Thank, Thank you, Alan. We will break the cycle of amnesty and illegal immigration. We will break the cycle. There will be no amnesty. Our message to the world will be this. You cannot obtain legal status or become a citizen of the United States by illegally entering our country. Can't do it. You take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. Also interesting is remember, it's illegal to possess uh, these stolen documents. It's different for the media. So everything you learn about this, you're learning from us. I want to know why nobody will demand that the Democrats disavow Antifa violence.